Hi everyone, hope you're all well. So, um, I imagine this is the sort of video where some people will see the, the title and they might instinctively respond to it. Um, I try to make my titles uh, appropriate, relevant, and um, I don't necessarily go for the most um, sensationalist titles. I just try to make them appropriate, sometimes shorter. So, um, yeah, uh, so please watch the video or at least a good bit of it before rushing to judgment. Um, if you are, you know, of the view that, oh, this guy's some leftist, you know, something like that, that's not the case. I identify as a political centrist. Um, and I'll just get one important thing out of the way. I've never considered myself to be a socialist. I think once when I was young, I briefly flirted with the idea. But um, I, I've never, I've never seen myself as a socialist, and um, I, I couldn't be a socialist because I think that fundamentally, socialism is anti-wealth. I'm not anti-wealth. I'm anti-exploitation, but I'm not anti-wealth. Uh, I think there is a difference. Um, but actually, my my feelings about this is why I was very interested in the political third way as promoted by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. That's not to say that they got everything right. I think, for example, um, I have Bill Clinton's autobiography, My Life. I haven't read it in full yet, but there are segments in that where he's coming down pretty hard on what he terms rather crudely the lazy poor, um, which is definitely to, to right-wing thinking. But that's what Clinton done and Blair as well. Um, in the case of Tony Blair and New Labour, it was the third way. So uh, not being anti-business, yet also being the government that brought in the minimum wage. Um, I mean, people forget how many achievements up there government had. It really was, um, you know, he didn't win three general elections for nothing. Um, but again, it was under New Labour that the degrading workfare uh, policy began. Now, this is an area when it comes to welfare and when it comes to those issues are probably are more to the left because I've been through the system. I know what it's like. Um, I think one thing that really needs to end is the culture of sanctions. Conservatives like to talk about, um, you know, benefit culture and people um, being reliant on the state. And I understand their argument. It's not good to have that reliance. It's good for people to be self-sufficient. But I also think they, they're too simplistic in how they look at it. They think that basically people who are sign who sign on are lazy, and not many conservatives will admit this. But I I can't forget that hideous campaign they had in twenty ten when they had those big ball billboards saying uh, "strivers versus scroungers." It was a very cynical way of stoking up animosity between people who had jobs and people who didn't. And naturally, people who had jobs. You know, they're working long hours, uh, maybe struggling to pay bills. They might feel resentful. Oh, these people have no jobs and they're getting free money from the state. What they don't understand is actually there's very strict obligations. And if you have a situation of so-called workfare, uh, which is not an official term, but basically you are told to go to a place of work. I've been through this. You're told to go to a place of work. You're basically assigned to it. You've got very little choice. And you're told to treat it like a regular job, but you're not paid a salary. Yes, you get the, as it was then called, job seekers allowance, but it really isn't the same as a regular salary. It's a lot less. Yeah, you're told to treat it like a job. Um, and I, in my opinion, it's exploitative. I, I would argue, okay, if you make people do the work, then pay them. That's reasonable. Um, I'm sure there's legal issues around it, and uh, I have to say, during the pandemic, that approach wasn't used uh, because, you know, the Chancellor was realistic. Um, so, in very recent years, there's been a more, uh, I don't want to say softer, because I think there's still some degrading things going on, but I think the approach has been a bit more realistic. Um, this, this idea that you could just bully unemployed people and treat them like criminals, and get bombarded with threatening letters from the DWP. It's um, it's really not on because people who are unemployed will have anxieties to begin with, with you know financial problems, obviously, from not getting an income. But um, 
it's really uh, something I dislike on that side of things. Now, around the world, there's many countries, most countries probably don't even have a welfare state. So if you're unemployed, you're basically, um, it probably is why in some of those countries, crime rates are so high. And I'm not making some sort of in-depth socio-political analysis here. It's just loose speculation. Uh, I think it might be easier to fall into that trap. Um, so I firmly believe in the principle of a welfare state, firmly, um, because most developed countries have it in some way or another. Um, and so it's just part of human progress. I think that, um, yes, people have individual responsibility, and I firmly believe that. But I also believe that we shouldn't have a society and a state that is so hands off and so, you know, everyone should fend for themselves that they don't provide a safety net. Um, I I really believe that strongly. I do think there are some conservatives, if they had their way, there'd be no welfare state. Uh, so unemployed people just like, well, you don't have a job, so you must be lazy. You know, they ignore the fact that they might have applied to numerous jobs. And it's a cycle because most employers see what experience you have. Now, if you can't get into that uh, system, you know, then it's a cycle. Because how do you get the experience if you're being rejected? So it's a cycle. I saw, talking of this cycle, I saw an advertisement. It was in the cinema, actually, and I don't usually like uh, non-film trailers in the cinema. They started to do that recently, having advertisements and so on. But I have to say it was effective. She was a young woman, and she was going to um, try and get a, a job. And uh, she couldn't get a job because she didn't have experience. She tried to open a bank account. She had no home, so she couldn't open a bank account. Um, then uh, it just showed that she was sort of walking around in circles, and it was just a cycle. Now, it was actually HSBC in partnership with Shelter, and they were sitting there trying to get people out of this um, cycle. If that's effective, that's obviously a good thing and it should be welcomed. Um, I think that's one of the problems in terms of homelessness. It's absurdity that homeless people can't open a bank account if they don't have a home. I mean, that's just cruel because how, how are they supposed to get any sort of, um, you know, mechanism for rebuilding their lives? Um, I think there's some misconceptions about homelessness, you know, um, the number of homeless people who are actually rough sleepers is a minority. So I've seen the figures. I think it's something like on a given night in the UK, it's something like 2,800 rough sleepers. Now, in a country of 68 million people, that's, that's a very small fraction, but it's still a lot of people to be in that situation. In my city alone, I can think of at least five people. I sort of recognise them because I've, I've helped them out a few times and bought them warm drinks and so on, they sort of know their faces. Um, in bigger cities, obviously, there'll be more. Edinburgh has a serious problem with that. London certainly does. But, you know, actually, most homeless people have a roof over their heads. They just don't have a permanent home. So that could be uh, sheltered accommodation, it could be staying with friends. Um, it's still a very bad situation to be in because they have constant anxiety. Um, and I really believe that it shouldn't be happening in the 21st century. And this gets me into the point about the video about capitalism. Now, I can't be a socialist. I'd be a hypocrite if I called myself a socialist. Why? Because I enjoy nice things. You know, I like treating myself. I go to the cinema. I buy myself nice coffee to relax. I like treating myself sometimes. Um, and I can't be a socialist because I've got ambitions. I'd like to get into business one day, you know. So if I was a socialist, I think the problem with socialism is it's not so much that it, it deems to be against exploitation and so on, which I'm against. It's that it is anti-wealth for the sake of being anti-wealth. I think socialists basically think rich people are bad people, and I don't agree with that. I think there are rich people that really do try to help other human beings. They've worked hard to get to where they're at, and they, they do a lot of good for humanity. Uh, I'm not just talking about providing jobs, I'm talking about philanthropy as well. Uh, having said that, there are some rich people I would question. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, talking of wealth, since it's directly related to the subject, Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, he has such astronomical wealth that millionaires look like mere peasants compared to these guys. 
Elon Musk is another. Now, I'm not going to say Jeff Bezos does nothing for charity. I'm sure he does. I'd be shocked if he'd done absolutely nothing. But, you know, he's putting his, he's investing his money into all these space programs. Well, Jeff Bezos made his wealth through Amazon. Amazon, not so long ago, I'm talking about a few years ago, um, was being reported on as having Dickensian, I quote, Dickensian conditions in its warehouses. Now, if that is still going on, I don't see how Jeff Bezos can sleep at night, you know, to have that sort of, to be so wealthy and to do it off the back of ex exploitation, if that is the case. Or at the very, very least, if I was in his position and I heard these reports, I would immediately be flying to the UK or to any country this was happening in, meeting those regional managers and demanding to know what's going on and demanding that conditions improve. I mean, conservatives always talk about business is the best thing, you know, let's support business because they create jobs. Well, that's true. That is absolutely true. But there's no honour or there's nothing noble about creating jobs if that is coming with exploitation. As an example, you might have a billionaire CEO and he or she is creating jobs, which is fundamentally a good thing. Of course it is. But what if those jobs are not being paid the minimum wage? What if there's exploitation going on? You know, where people are being treated in a really unfair way and they feel it's a David and Goliath situation where they cannot speak out because if they do, they could lose their job. Um, now, I think most companies have a sort of ethical policy nowadays. I'm not just talking about on green issues, which is the big thing, but uh, on labor rights. But, you know, this is why it's so, so important to have a free press. A few years ago, Costa Coffee got in trouble because of the way they were treating baristas, taking away tips, for example. Um, that sort of thing disgusts me. The fact that these big companies just treat people like commodities in that way. And they always go out of the way to get people. They always say that our company is a family and you're X, Y, and Z. And, you know, um, even if most employees have a good experience, if just a few people are exploited, to me, that is enough. Um, I feel very strongly about this. And it probably is a more left-wing side of me. I hate exploitation. I hate this idea that you force people to work um, and you underpay them or you treat them in a very unfair way. It's just, it's just not needed. It's just, I mean, as a market principle, if someone is unhappy in work, they're probably going to be less productive because they're going to be anxious about going into work. Um, but, you know, when I, when I look at our situation, I'm grateful to live in the UK. My goodness, I know that struggling in this country is not the same as struggling in some other parts of the world. Nevertheless, um, it's not good enough to say, oh, well, our situation is better, so let's just be complacent. There are a lot of people in this country who have serious financial anxieties. And that isn't just people at the absolute bottom, like homeless people. This could be people who aren't homeless, but they're just struggling to pay bills and so on. Um, and there's there's a lot of areas to look at this. And it isn't just, you know, it isn't just about capitalism because you can find this in self-described socialist states. You can find people struggling. I mean, recently I spoke to a Vietnamese acquaintance and she was sort of insisting that Vietnam socialist, not communist. I pointed out it's still a single party state that doesn't really tolerate dissent, but there you have it. Um, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, though, that communist states don't call themselves communist. They know that there's a stigma with the word, and rightly so. And for the record, I love communism, um, because wherever there has been a communist regime, there has been uh, an attack on freedom and human rights, wherever it's existed, whether it be the People's Republic of China, North Korea, North Vietnam, Ethiopia uh, during the Red Terror, Cuba. And there's other examples too. So I despise communism. I also believe that uh, the world is a globalized place. That's just a reality. So being anti-capitalism, I think, is just not realistic. The world is capitalist. When the Cold War ended, that was the way the world went. We are in a capitalist world. Even communist China is a hybrid system. I mean, I would say there is such a thing as Chinese capitalism. Um, you know, you see those gleaming skyscrapers 
and Shanghai and Shenzhen. And it's it's pure capitalism. You know, capitalism with a Chinese face. You have the totalitarianism of a communist state, but you actually also have the negative side effects of capitalism in that system. Because there isn't really a welfare state in China. And, you know, people who are struggling in China, it's, it's really difficult. Um, but, you know, I'm not sort of a fiery Marxist, like, oh, let's bring down the system. I I am not anti well for the sake of it. But, you know, if you have ever struggled financially, I don't know how anyone who has ever struggled financially cannot have human empathy. And, you know, you get, frankly, some working class conservatives, and, you know, that's their right. They can vote whatever way they want. But I think they get a little bit self righteous. I'm a working class Tory. So, you know, these lefties, how dare they complain? Because I'm a working class Tory. Well, my issue with that is they're sort of thinking, because I struggled, no one else should complain. No one should complain because that's... Um, I think this is a very cold attitude. Um, I would say if you've been through something, you should have more empathy, not less empathy. This is not to say that you need to agree with socialist principles or you have to vote Labour if you are working class. Of course not. I mean, there's issues, the whole red wall thing um, of the 2019 general election, I think a big part of that, I think there was se several factors, but I think a big part of it was that the Labour Party had taken the working class for granted for too long. I think they pitched to sort of this academic metropolitan left-wing set, which was very much about woke ideology, you know, much more than things people care about. I think that's a big mistake Labour has made. It's slightly better under Starmer, but not much. Starmer still very much pitches to the woke left rather than looking at bread and butter issues that people care about. Um, or at least not looking at those as much as he should be. Uh, I'm not overly enthusiastic about Keir Starmer. Um, you know, ideally, I would, I would like to see a centre-left government just for, uh, you know, for democracy. We've had 11 years in the Tories. It would be good to have a centre-left government in the mould of someone like Clement Alley or even a Harold Wilson. But I think that um, Starmer just lacks something. He's more of a lawyer than a politician. And I also think, frankly, he lacks courage when it comes to issues that he really needs to be speaking out on. Um, I mean, he's he's doing fine in terms of holding the government to account. I've not so much a problem with that. I'm talking about things like um, the fact that he call, failed to call out the Islamists who threatened the teacher in Batley. I know I've mentioned that many times, but I think it's an important point. But I digress. You know, so anyone who's ever struggled, I think if you're a decent human being, you should have basic empathy. I personally feel that some conservatives lack empathy. I, I'm careful to say some, because I've known conservatives who are thoroughly nice people. They give generously to charity. They care about human rights. They're decent, hardworking people. But I do think some conservatives do themselves no favours. They give this impression that they have a fundamental just lack of empathy. And I think there is a survival of the fittest mentality there. Like, if you're struggling, there must be something wrong with you. You must be lazy, or you must just be a whiner, or, you know, this sort of mentality. Now, I don't like quotas. I don't like positive discrimination. And I certainly don't like identity politics. But that is not perfect. And I think that when people struggle, they're not whining because they talk about it. I don't agree with this sort of stoic attitude of, you know, well, you know, let's never express feelings. Let's never express frustrations because if you do, you're entitled or you're whining. If you've been treated unfairly, I firmly believe in speaking out. Because after all, how do things change? If you've been treated unfairly by a company, or even, uh, I don't mean even if you're an employee, but if you're a consumer, if uh, you've had a bad experience with a company, um, you know, you have to complain because if you don't, nothing changes. This is what people need to consider. Nothing changes um, in company policy if they don't hear feedback. Maybe nothing will still change. But at least it should be there for the record. So um, what I'd like to see is a little bit more of the third way approach. We have a pretty right-wing government at the moment. 
some of the things they've done, I mean, cancelled spending and so on, um, during COVID, that was definitely to the left. But I think that was temporary. I think there is a best, big disconnect with Boris Johnson and the country. I mean, he had a long honeymoon period. Most prime ministers, it's usually about six months. With Johnson, it was probably about two years. Um, because this whole clownish, eccentric image, it actually worked. You know, he's a character. He, he, he stands out. But I think at this point, even a lot of conservatives now are openly saying, is this man serious? Is this government serious? Um, and I do think there are echoes of the major years in terms of sleeves. Um, there is just a perception that, I don't know, that we have a prime minister who is flippant about important issues um, too often. And I, I feel that way. I feel that, um, I don't know, I, I just find it, hard to see Johnson as a serious Prime Minister. I want to. And I think he has some capable people around him. But I I don't know. I don't have much faith in this government. I've never voted Tory, but I'm open-minded. Um, certainly in areas of national defence and crime, I think the Tories, I would certainly be more confident in them than any other party. But, you know, politics is a funny old game. And, uh, who knows? But getting back to the point of the video, capitalism, um, I think it's good that, you know, there's been more of an ethical consideration in companies in recent years. But it's not just about green issues, um, important as those are. It's also about a lot of things. I mean, I, I think, you know, a company that can't even be bothered to tell you why they're rejecting you I had this experience recently, actually, and it's like, you know, if you're struggling and you're just trying to get on with life and you're just trying to do the right things, then it's not good enough to say, oh, don't whine if there's a problem, because it's not whining. It's expressing human frustration. I'm doing the best I can, and I keep getting these blocks. So, for example, recently I tried to get onto a teaching platform, italki, and I've given them a review, so, you know, I'm not going behind their back here. They know my views about it. Um, I've done everything they asked. I uploaded a video. I have all the qualifications. I've expent, uh, I've plenty of experience. So I can't think of any rational reason why they would reject me. And they rejected me, no reason given. Now, of course, I was disappointed with the rejection because I wanted an opportunity to pitch to more students. But I was very frustrated with the lack of an explanation. And even when I raised this point, you just couldn't be bothered. Oh, it's company policy. It might be company policy. But I take the view if someone puts the time and energy into, uh, you know, trying to make an effort for what you're asking for, at the very least have the respect to give them a reason. And someone, you know, pointed this and said, oh, but then they might have to give a reason for everyone. Well, why not? Even if it's one line, is that so much to ask? If they're asking people to put the time in, I mean, maybe they should have someone designated for that sort of role. So for me, a company that can't even be bothered to do that, it's it's callous and it's inconsiderate. Um, because it's not just about, I want to know the reason. If I know the reason, then I can improve. I can say, okay, well, I fell short in that area. I can improve because I'm not the sort of person to play the victimhood card. I don't always say, oh, it's because of this or that. Uh, I'm a victim. I don't see myself as a victim. But at the same time, I think people need to be empowered to speak up for themselves and to be able to have avenues to complain. For example, about a company that is just treating people like dirt. And if I ever get into business, if I'm ever uh, financially successful, I will really, really, really pressure myself to make sure that I'm standing up for the principles I believe in, helping people, trying to empower people. I really, really, really believe in that. Um, now, it might never happen. I might never be a wealthy man. Um, as it stands, I'm okay at the moment. I'm not struggling the way some people are, but uh, I can't say that I'm overly excited about my situation. Uh, I have my concerns, as most people do. And I think fundamentally what I would conclude with this video is of all the options available, I think we have to accept the fact that we are in a globalised world, we are in a capitalist world, 
But within that, I do think there can be such a thing as compassionate capitalism. That is to say, pro-business, pro-growth, but also considering human beings. When we look at an expression, I should have said this at the start of the video, you know, we look at wealth, so-and-so is worth this amount, whether it be a footballer or a singer, a singer who is worth this amount. That, that's a saying I really abhor because how can we talk about human beings in that sort of sense? I mean, there's other aspects I dislike about capitalism. I, I dislike the materialism that comes with it. This idea that, especially at this time of year and, you know, coming up to Christmas, there's this pressure for people to get presents. And, you know, I do, my family does, but I'm pleased to say we don't go over the top. I think some families do. And it's kind of this judgment like, how much is your present worth? But then it's every year. And how many presents do people actually hold on to? This is why, to me, it should be about being there for people. It should be about, you know, expressing love in other ways as well. Not by how much value a present is. It's something that I really have a problem with. Um, so I dislike that sort of materialism. I mean, my goodness, Halloween isn't even over. They've already got the Christmas stock out. And it's just, it's everywhere. Or Black Friday sales. You know, people go crazy. They get into fist fights and worse. Over what? Getting a discount? It's like, seriously, people. Are you civilized human beings or what? It's just, uh, people get vindictive and unpleasant. And it's just, um, this is something I think does come from capitalism. It's a materialistic side to it. I really dislike. Um, you know, so people can inspire faith, but it's one thing I think the church is right about to to um, say that materialism in that sense is not good for people. Having said that, the Catholic Church is very wealthy, and they certainly go out of their way with ornate shrines of the Virgin Mary and so on. But I don't know. I just think that um, if you are on the lower end of the scale in the capitalist system, in any system, it's hard. It's very hard. And, you know, that feeling of financial struggle, it's not only the anxiety from it, it's very lonely, especially when you think that other people are doing better. It's not about jealousy. It's about feeling lonely, feeling left out. And then people feel self-aware. They don't want to, you know, people make conversation. Oh, what do you do for a living? Or well, maybe they're unemployed. And I think there's less of a stigma than there used to be. But I think people are judgmental, unfortunately. Um. I mean, this thing, I'm between jobs, it's basically a way of saying I'm not unemployed. Or I'm unemployed, but I don't want to say that. And I think it's because people fear judgment. Um, it's unfortunate. But I'll just conclude by saying, you know, money will never, ever, ever, ever replicate character. It will never replicate being decent to other human beings. It's not about being a saint. It's just about... Being a decent human being, treating people the way you want to be treated. And I really believe that. Um, there's a post that's kind of gone viral about the actor Keanu Reeves. Now, if that's true, um, it makes you know it hard not to dislike the guy. Um, or rather, uh, I said that wrong. It makes it hard uh, to not... to Yeah, it makes it hard to... It makes him very likable. That's what I'm trying to say. If those posts are true, basically is talking about the fact he, he really struggled in life with some serious personal trauma. He lost people very close to him. He had three stepfathers, yet he still rides by public transport. I mean, this guy, you know, he's a Hollywood actor. He's probably a multimillionaire. But if that's true, Keanu Reeves is a good example um, of what we should try and be like as human beings, if it's true. Um... I mean, I've always got a good vibe from him. I don't think he's the world's best actor. I've always got a good vibe. I just, there's something about the guy that just seems sincere. I don't know what it is in interviews and so on. He just comes across that way. Uh, anyway, that's my lecture over. Let me know your thoughts. I, I think it's just, empathy is so important. Kindness is important. These things matter. It's not about putting on a big facade or virtue signaling. It's just about being a decent human being. And I think sometimes in capitalist systems, we forget that. This whole thing about money is everything. Um, of course it is. If 
if you're a multimillionaire and it is the main focus. But I think, frankly, there are some rich people out there who are really not happy. They might have all the material wealth, have a nice home. They might even be married, but, you know, they, they're not fundamentally happy. So existence as human beings has to be deeper than material things. It has to be. Money is great. It gives us stability. So I think it would be a foolish sentiment to say money doesn't matter. Of course it does. You need money for stability. But it's not everything, and it can never, ever replicate human beings, and it shouldn't be seen that way. Thanks for listening.